Hey, Brother Rico, Enrico. Hello. Hello. Good morning, sir. How are you doing? Okay, sir. If somebody, if somebody is trying to join, you see an, an American is trying to join. Is it, sir? Somebody else is trying to join. You... Somebody else is trying to join. Um, I don't see that person. Is a is another teacher. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Ronel. Ronel, not Ronel. Um, somebody else. Yeah. Okay, brother Enrico. There's a John Griffin. You see him? Put put the there's a click the audio. 
There's something that said, um, join with audio also. Mute on the left hand side of your, or right, the left hand side of your. Um, Brother Enrico. Okay. Now, yes. how's that doing? Yes, I'm hearing you. Are you hearing him, Brother Enrico? I, I see a great Jamaican. Yes, sir. Carson? Yes, sir. I'm hearing you. I'm hearing you. I see you. Okay. <laughs> Brother Enrico. I can't hear you. You can't hear me? Can you hear me now? It's almost nothing. Can you hear me now? You can't hear him. <clears throat> you check the volume of your computer. Can you turn it up? There's a vol volume button on your computer. You hear me better now? I don't know which one, but I see you. Are you hearing me now? It's very faint, very, very faint. Okay. I, I can't hear you. No, I'm not talking. Are you hearing me now? Oh, but but when you talk, it's it's just almost un, unintelligible. Oh. Uh, I don't see anything here to uh, increase anything. Uh, uh, Brother Enrico. Brother Johnson, do you, are you hearing me well? Yes, I'm hearing you well. Okay. okay. I can I can very, very faintly hear you. Thank you. Can you hear me now? Yes, sir. Oh, that's better. That's better. Hello. Brother Enrico? Oh yes, sir. I can hear you now. Can you? Yes. Can you hear the other teacher? Brother okay, Jones? I can hear you. Yeah, 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 I can hear him. Hello, good morning. Hello, what, what is your name? Uh, Enrico Simpson. Hello, okay, Enrico Simpson. Uh, good morning. <laughs> your name is? John Griffin. Oh, okay, brother John. Okay, so Brother Enrico is going to have to... Carson calls me Brother John. So for this, for this class, we're going to, um, you guys are going to listen to Brother um, John Griffin, okay? Okay. Yeah. I, I can't hear Carson. Can you hear me now? I hear you now. All right. 
You can go ahead, Brother John. Okay. <clears throat> so, um, good morning. Um, is Enrico the only one on? Um, Brother Hunter. Oh, okay. All right. Brother, I, don't know, I don't know much about I do not know much about Zoom, so bear with me. That's okay. Brother Carson wanted me to talk to y'all about uh, the parables that are in the uh, New Test in the New Testament and mostly recorded in Ma Matthew and in Luke. Um, I don't have a list of the parables. I just wanted to talk to you about the things that Jesus, who were who spoke in parables and who did this to show people how that God wanted them to live a life and he used their life situations to make lessons about the truth of God and how that they could take a story that Jesus would tell and understand his meaning when he was teaching how that they should live. Mm -hmm. And in Matthew, we have recorded the Sermon on the Mount. And after the Sermon on the Mount, as he was teaching in different places, he would bring in life situations to bring home truths about God, about how that God wanted people to live, how that God wants people to treat each other, and how that some people were doing things unaware of how it was affecting others. And so sometimes he would tell stories so that they could compare what a person would do in their normal life as applied to what they should do in response to God and his teachings and his want for others but all through the parables we will see that an underlying quality of Jesus is in these parables he had compassion upon people Jesus came to the earth for a very specific person to save man to provide a way for man to be saved but they had to understand what God wanted. And so Jesus experienced life as a person. And through his observations of people's living and how that people went about their lives, he would use these stories to compare God and his spiritual needs or his his spiritual instructions through physical examples that's you can say that would be what the parables are they would be physical examples of of life in general in their in, in their realm in in the people that were of jesus's day and the things that they their common language their common use of uh, um I'm not very good with my English. Uh, their, their common use of sayings, and he would use those to tell a truth about what God wanted spiritually from people, all people, and how they should focus their lives upon God as instead of personal and uh, things of greed and those things. And so he would use those to tell, uh, sometimes to uh, help with a, a hyperbole, and he would do a hyperbole of, of a situation that would make people think about what it was to approach God and also our position towards God, where we are in comparison to who God is. Um, 
I just look at one. There's one in Luke chapter 7, verse 41. And he, he was speaking to a Pharisee who he had gone into their house. And this Pharisee was all caught up into the things that the men or the whole uh, people of the Pharisees thought of themselves. They thought of themselves as elite above others. And, and they look down upon women. They look down upon people who were poor or uh, less fortunate, uh, who sometimes were ignorant. And he, they look down upon actual people that were not a very good character sometimes. But they themselves set, set themselves above those as assuming that of course, they are of the best of character. And so this parable that Jesus spoke in Luke chapter 7, about verse 40, he spoke to a man named Simon, and, and he, he compares in this parable a creditor, a man who had money, and he loans it out to people. And he had, he talks about two debtors. And the Pharisee didn't see what Jesus saw. And Jesus wanted him to see his position was not what he thought it was. And so he uses this parable and he says this creditor and he makes the Pharisee think about a creditor and two debtors. And one of the debtors was different from the other. But both of them were forgiven their debt, but they were different. And we see that <clears throat> these debtors were in such position that they had no way of settling their debt with this credit or with this Lord. But one was in great debt. Mm -hmm. And another was in a smaller situation debt, but still could not pay. So Jesus just asked him, who was the most thankful person? And so it makes a person who Jesus was wanting to teach a lesson look, in, to look back to themselves. And so, so he asked him, he says, which header would be more thankful? Because one was relieved of a huge debt. One was relieved of a much smaller one. And of course, the man said, well, the man who owed the most, a logical conclusion is okay. that the one who owed most was going to be most thankful. And then he points this parable, he turns this parable now and said, look, in essence, I'm just paraphrasing. He well, John, said, here's one who, yes. Uh, can we turn to that parable? Uh, yes, I said it was in Luke 7 40. Luke 7 40, really. Luke 7 40. Hmm? Luke 7, 40. I'm seeing it. Yes, sir. Okay. Then you can go I, ahead. I had, I had already referenced it. Mm -hmm. But as you read there, he compare, He says, here's this, this person, this woman who the, the Pharisee was looking down upon, saying, oh, she's in deep sin. And I'm just maybe a little bit. There's nothing wholly wrong with me. And so he makes this Pharisee see that the one that owed the greatest debt would be the most thankful. But he was looking, that, but that Pharisee was looking in disdain at the woman, like how does she even deserve to be in here? But Jesus said she was more thankful than you are, Simon, because you said she needed a lot forgiven and she was thankful for it and he was not. And so mm -hmm. it compares. Uh, of course, everybody is is concerned with, or is familiar, I'll say, with the parable of the soul. And Jesus compares to a farmer sowing seed and how that it lands in different situations, the same seed that goes out of his hand lands in different situations and, and produces different results. 
And so he makes that comparison of the word of God going out and the hearts of the people that are different. And therefore, the seed will grow. And so he's comparing a physical thing with a spiritual truth so that people can see that this word of God is going out, but the reception, the, the soul that receives the seed, of course, mm -hmm. is going to produce in the manner that it is prepared. And so if, if a seed is, is uh, landing in a place that's very well prepared, that seed will do good. And we know that we go out, we have a garden, and we prepare soil very well. And so we have a good crop in the garden. But if it falls over in the weeds or in the trees, uh, it's not going to grow well because it's not nurtured. And so Jesus was wanting people to say, look at themselves and say, I need to prepare my heart so that that seed will grow well. Uh, mm -hmm. Of course, then he uses uh, <clears throat> things. Well, let me, let me make a, a, a reference here about how that Jesus looked at people and he loved people and he had compassion upon them in their situation that sometimes were of none of their doing and they could not uh, help themselves. Others could. But if you look there, since we have was open into the book of Luke, in chapter 7 of Luke, we have uh, verse 12, and where Jesus was coming into a city and he met a funeral procession of a woman with her only son. So therefore, she had lost her only son. And also that son was good because she was a widow, was her only means of support in those days. And had, there she had lost it. And so she's weeping. And the Lord sees her. And in verse 13 of Luke chapter 7, I what's important to see, the Lord looked at her and he had compassion on her. So he said to her, do not weep. And we know that he went about, he performed a miracle and he brought the son back to life. And mm -hmm. this was such a great relief. And it's not just because she had lost her son and the emotional effect there, but it's because her, her means of life support was renewed also, was restored to her. So the, the things that Jesus did even in teaching the parables, it wasn't just to look down towards someone. It was because he loved them and he wanted them to have an understanding of how God looks at us and mm -hmm. sees us as sinners. And he wants us, he wants us back to him in a restored relationship. So, so the things that they that Jesus talks about uh, in these parables are things that would stimulate people to want to come back to God, want to think about how God sees us. Um, there's another one I want to look at in Matthew chapter 18. Look in Mac Matthew chapter 18, verse... Well, there's two places. Verse 30, where he talks about we need to be converted as little children. We need to receive God as a child receives instructions. Now, many people misconstrue this teaching about the kingdom of heaven and children will be the greatest. But it's not that. It's the attitude of a child that Jesus is looking for. Though a child is not caught up in his own righteousness, his own ideas, his own mm -hmm. pride. He is humble and he is looking for instruction. And God said, I want my children, my spiritual children to be like this. And so I'm, I'm doing this to go, go to a parable here about lost sheep there in, in chapter 18 of Matthew. And yeah. he says... In verse 10, take heed that you do not despise these little ones that he had described. 
these ones who are innocent in heart and want to learn. And then he goes into verse 11, and one of the main things that Jesus showed his reason for being here in verse 11, the Son of Man is come to save that which was lost. Now, many do not know that they're lost. And so he tries to make pictures with people of their life, of things that they know. So he goes on and he says there, so he gives an example here, a parable about a man with a hundred sheep. And he wants people to understand that every child of God is important to God. And so just as I was talking about that Pharisee thinking that that woman who was, quote, a sinner, a low person in society was not as important as he's a Pharisee. And so here in another parable, Jesus is saying, you are all important because he emphasized to that Pharisee that that woman is as important in God's eyes as he, the Pharisee, was, who he did not see that. And so here he compares a flock of sheep in a fold, safe in a place. This, and he says there's a hundred of them. And he uses this a hundred and only one. So it's a large difference in number. And so many people would have a flock of sheep and they would have a hundred sheep and one of them gets away. And he's busy, and he said he would say, "Oh, who cares? One sheep. I got. All, I got. Still got ninety-nine. I'm not going to leave my ninety and nine and go after that one sheep. And something happened to these. So one sheep is expedient, is expendable. And Jesus is showing that God does not look at us that way. He does not look at the big number." only. He's glad to have all 99 that are there, but he is very, God is very concerned about one soul that can be lost. Mm -hmm. And that's what he's showing in this parable, that you are all important to God. And he's saying this good shepherd will leave his 99 safe ones and go out in great danger, in great difficulty and get that last lone sheep. And in verse 14, he says, even so, it is not the will of your father who is in heaven that even one of these little ones should perish. He wanted the people to know that God was concerned with all of them, whereas the Pharisees and the uh, scribes and especially the Sadducees considered themselves elite much more important and that they would they would focus on saving one of theirs as opposed to a poor uh, person of low esteem, low esteem of and maybe even a, a person who was of bad morals. But God was concerned with a poor person, even with bad morals. He wanted that one back in his fold. And so he uses this parable to show how important we all are to God. I don't know, looking here, for another one. Look in Matthew chapter six after this, uh, during the Sermon on the Mount, he even does sort of a parable there about seeking the kingdom of God first. And he looks at it as life and the animals, the birds of the air, the uh, flowers. And he shows them, he says, you see all these things. And he reminds them, and this is more important today than it was because so many people today, number one, do not believe that God put that flower out there, that God made these birds and these animals, and that he made the world so that they could all be sustained and, and continue. But Jesus says, 
look at these things that God has made. And look at these things that God takes care of. And he makes the world in a manner that there's always food for the birds. There's always soil to grow flowers for beauty. And so God dresses the world. God sustains all of the animals that he creates in a manner that man does not have to take care of. Man can see about them, but man does not take care of them. God takes care of them. The birds, the flowers. And so Jesus is using this as a parable to say, you see how these things are sustained continually for thousands of years since the beginning. The birds have not ceased. Animals, even the creeping things, the insects have not ceased. The plants, the beautiful plants we have, the flowers, they all are sustained by God in a because he made things to reproduce and he made things to one feed off of the other so that they were sustained. So he tells people, he says, God created all these things that will live and die and they're gone and there's, there's nothing left. And if an animal dies, what does he do? He lays out there in the field or in the forest and he rots away. And the bugs feed on him. The soil absorbs him. Even the funguses that grow that sustain other, the plants absorb. And so he's, he is turned back into the earth. But then he reminds them, but he says, God made one thing that is different. He made man. And he made this man and he gave him a spiritual life, a life that can be sustained forever. And God has prepared that life just as he prepared the birds, the plants to sustain themselves. But he sustains the life of man. But he's telling us if God made us in his image, much more important than the animal which dies and goes back into the earth, than the plant that dies and is returned into the soil. But he says, God made you in his image. And he says, do you not think that God cares for you, that he will take care of something made in his image? So he says, you need faith and you need to believe that God will do these things. They had forgotten. Just as today, man has forgotten his purpose on the earth. His purpose on the earth is to go around and build buildings, shall we say? Is it to make a kingdom or make a, a, um, a following that a king may have or a president? Uh, or, or to gr gain great riches. Is, this what he, is that what he, we're here for? I want to refer to a scripture of the man who is considered the wisest man that God put on the earth. His name was Solomon, the son of David. And Solomon went through and wrote a book called Ecclesiastes, where he looked at all of the pursuits of life and where they went. And Jesus was really talking about that in this parable of the pursuits of life uh, in the animal and the plant realm is just to, to sustain themselves till they die. But Solomon goes through all the things that man chases after that end up with nothing because they've left God out. Of it. But in the end of the book of Ecclesiastes, if you turn over to Ecclesiastes chapter 12, at the end of that chapter, during the end of the book, Solomon makes one conclusion. He says of many books, many learning and reading and studying is wearisome. Will wear you out trying to figure out what is life. But he said it's, it's much simpler than that. He said of all these things that people chase after and try to learn and know more, he said there is one basic conclusion. God made us for himself. He made us to be like him. 
And if we try to figure out the wisdom of God, we will not ever figure it out. And he says we will wear ourselves out trying to. Wearisome to the flesh in verse 12. But the conclusion in verse 13, we are here to keep God's commandments. This is our whole duty. And in verse 14, he says, the reason we are to do this is because God will bring every act into judgment. Everything, good or bad. And I have a note by this that I've wrote down years ago. People today are blinded by material things and fail to see this true picture of why are we here? Because we are selfish, because we are self-centered. And in Jesus's parables, that's, that's one of the things he did. He, he, he made people look into themselves with a story about something in life. Um, it comes to mind, and I don't, I'm not finding exactly where it is, Brother Carson. Mm -hmm. um, the parables about um, the lost treasure, the treasure buried in a field, the uh, woman who lost a uh, pearl of a, a great a pearl, no, the man who, who saw a pearl of great price, and the woman who lost the coin. These three parables are, Jesus used them to show how important. And, and I, want, I, I went to Solomon in saying that the most important thing we are to do is to fear God and keep his commandment. Because in these three parables that Jesus spoke, they were about what is really important. What does man see as truly important? Mm -hmm. And what will what is it worth in everything that you have to get something very important? Uh, today in America, more that I see, people have so much that they have trouble differentiating what is most important and what's not, because we are blessed with no real wants. Now, I know people complain, but the complaining is nothing compared to other places in the world. Even you in Jamaica have much more difficult struggle in just maintaining life so, and working than people so, in this country. Rajan? Yes. Yeah, um, I totally agree with you because when I look upon my my situation, other people's situation. Um, I said to myself, at one, at one point, I used to be a complainer. And then I said to myself, why complain? I mean, God has blessed me with a, with a third opportunity. To get to be, be at the, um, the JSP to be a minister. So a lot of things that I might not have, I said to myself that, Whatever situation I find myself in, I'm just being content until God bless me, you know? I'm just working out of, of his strength. I, I understand. And in my life, in, in a life of, um, I was a pharmacist for many years. And I remember when I was younger, I would complain about this and say, well, you know, I'm having all this trouble and I see others who are doing well in pharmacy and I'm struggling and I can barely pay my bills. But later I understood that this helped me in understanding the world that we live in and that not giving up, even though I saw others doing better, but I kept going forward and in the end it seems sometimes I have am in a better situation than some others you know because work diligently can in in the realm of of 
material things can produce good things, but spiritual understanding hard work spiritually, difficulties and overcoming difficulties. And I think that Jesus was emphasizing that in his teaching and in the parable. And in these three that I named, he emphasized that if we see something that is important and we understand that it is the most important thing in the world, we should sacrifice everything that we have to obtain that treasure that was in that field, that pearl that was very expensive, and that coin that that woman lost. They were, they were all something that was needed to be uh, obtained. And Jesus is trying to show people in these parables that mm -hmm. the importance of seeking God and the kingdom of God mm -hmm. is so much more important than all of the things that we put in our lives in front of God, before God, that we are not seeing the bread, the picture. Because I I sit and think about these things, and what if the man in the field saw the tre treasure in the field, and he says, "Man, I, I see the price of that that field, and I can't afford it because my wife she needs some things. I got to buy her something." I want to have my kids sustained and go to college and have a good life and all of these things. I, I really, I need that treasure, but that price in that field, that's just too much. I can't give, I can't give my life savings just to get that treasure. So he in that way would have held on to his treasures that he already had and not spent that for a much greater, a much greater treasure. And sometimes in life, we see that we try to hold on to things that are small. Mm -hmm. The greatest treasure is there to obtain, but and I think Jesus was teaching the lesson that you sh you may have to give up all things to obtain that treasure. Mm -hmm. That widow, uh, that woman who lost that coin, she stopped whatever she was doing mm -hmm. and spent a lot of time and a lot of effort to find that coin. The man who saw the pearl in the market, if he had he had vision to see that if he got that pearl, it would make him multiplying times richer and more successful. And so he had to spend, it says he spent all that he had. I mean, I, I know in my life, I've never spent all that I had trying to get something. And so would we, would we do what Jesus was saying? And, and I'll go in, in that, that comparison of those parables of when Jesus was talking to the disciples about uh, who would sacrifice and give all, who would go against family. He, he was telling the Christians, potential Christians, disciples, that if you follow God, you need to take into account. And there's another parable that just comes to mind that he used. I'll, I'll go, go to that in a moment. But are you willing to give all? Are you willing to break ties with your family? Are you willing to go against even the government in the threat of imprisonment? And so he says, what price would you pay? And, and we need to think about that. People who say, well, I'm going to follow the Lord, and they get all excited. Okay, that goes back to that sower who threw seed into an area that was really rich soil, but it was very thin. 
And underneath that very rich soil, there was not much. It was rocks. And so the, are, are we, do we take into account what it takes to sustain ourselves the long term with God? He made another comparison. He said, look out here at a king who's got his country ready. And he's, and, and he's being threatened, and he says, I'm going to have to go to war with this guy over here that's to my east. And we're going to have to fight. Does he not look at what that king over there has? How many soldiers? Not only how many soldiers, but how much equipment? How many resources does that man have? And how many do I have? And if he has a huge bounty of riches and equipment and many more does that first king not co consider well maybe i don't need to go over there and stir him up maybe i don't need to fight him in other words jesus said are you will you look at life ahead and serving me are you willing to go into that war into that fight he said consider the cost that it is to be a Christian because we can see throughout the writings of the, of the rest of the New Testament how that some were real excited and that's what Jesus had in mind when he had that parable about the seed falling on the stony ground and the seed falling in amongst the thorns or the bushes will you be able to fight against the thorns and the bushes Will you be able to break through the hard, rocky soil? Or are you a person with a depth of heart and conviction to do the right thing no matter what? To produce. And so Peter, and of course, Peter is the one that speaks up, but the apostles heard this. And Jesus is talking about, you know, you may have to fight your father. You may have to fight your mother or your sister or your brother, and they may turn you in and say, my brother or my son has gone crazy, and you need to, the authorities need to take him in, turn you in for your belief in Christ. He said, are you willing to fight your family, are you willing to fight your, the political system where you live, are you willing to fight your need for wealth, your own inward need for comfort and wealth. Are you willing to sacrifice that for me? Because Peter spoke up and said, Lord, and we've left all to follow you. What is, what, what will that return? Well, Jesus answered him and said, for you who have left all, you will be you will be set as judges over the world. You will sit on thrones. Now, this is not physical, but this is spiritual. You will sit on thrones in authority for what you have done for me. In other words, he says the reward that is waiting is so much greater than any sacrifice we might make. You know, mm -hmm. Paul yeah. may have talked to Timothy when he wrote to him, and he said, what I see coming for me and my service to God in prison, going to die, is so much greater that I fear, do not fear death, I do not fear punishment i do not fear persecution or anything because i saw it. paul had a vision but we can see that same thing and in these pair i think jesus wanted people to understand it. in these parables these comparisons that nothing when peter asked he said what will we receive because we have left all and mm -hmm. jesus said those who have left all will receive a bounty that's more than a hundredfold. So that is another 
comparison that Jesus made with a parable. Um, there is there are parables about stewardship, about responsibility. And Jesus, I'm not seeing that one right now. Here we go. <clears throat> he makes a um, he set, tells a parable in Luke chapter 16 about some a steward, a man left with responsibility. And a man who didn't take care of his responsibility. Mm -hmm. And how they, he figured his way into life after he is called into account. And so Jesus, and some people look at this and go, well, Jesus is condoning man who was really conniving and underhanded in his dealings. And, and he wasted his master's money for his own, his own safety. But what Jesus was trying to tell people is in verse 9 and 10 of that chapter 16 of Luke. And he says, and I say to you, make friends for yourselves by unrighteous mammon or wealth. That when you fall or fail, they will receive you into an everlasting home. So he's saying things that people use unrighteously can be used by God's children, not in an unrighteous manner. But he says, you see how this man used these things to prepare himself for the, for the future without a job. He says, we can use the things of this world. And I believe that he's saying, if we say we have a business that's making a lot of money, if you, if you do it honestly, it is not wrong to make a lot of money. It's what you do with that lots of money. And I think Jesus is saying, if you, if you have resources that other people use for bad things, you can use them to prepare yourself for a better way. And, and even spiritually, he's saying, you take into account these people that are using material things to make themselves a, what shall we say in this country, a rich environment. So we're saving up and we're putting back uh, assets so that we can retire and go uh, go into an old age with comfort. Well, Jesus said, think about this. Should you not prepare yourself spiritually mm -hmm. with things that maybe some people are using unrighteously, but you could use it to your advantage to ground yourself in truth, to use other people's mistakes this is spiritual now. You can look at other people's mistakes mm -hmm. and you can be shrewd about that and say, well, I see what they did and I will not go into that. I will not step into problems because I see the results. And so I can prepare myself for a greater spiritual strength as I grow older. And so we can use the wisdom that man uses for himself uh, selfishly to prepare ourselves spiritually. And so in, in verse 10, I think that this is the thing. He who is faithful in what he is least is faithful in much. Mm -hmm. He who is unjust in what is least is unjust in much. And in Matthew chapter 25, there's another parable that reflects this, that Jesus says, if you are a faithful person, it doesn't matter how much you have. It's what you prepare and do with what you have. And in Matthew 25, it's, it's about the, the five talent, the two talent, and the one talent uh, men who had different amounts of, of, of money and 
how they used it and their attitude towards it. So Jesus is saying a faithful person will do will be a be faithful and do right with a lot or with a little. So we don't have to say, well, that man there's got a lot of money and he can do a lot of work and I can't do all that because I don't have that kind of money. I can't help that many people. It's not how many people you help. It is how you help each one. So if you only have one person that you can help, you are, you should be faithful in doing that. Because a person who is going to be tempted with great wealth to do wrong things will be mm -hmm. tempted to do wrong things with a little bit because it's the heart attitude. And I think the whole deal was Jesus said, you see how that people maneuver and manipulate things for themselves in this, this realm, this world, this physical. Also, what, what kind of a attitude do you have spiritually in making your life a pattern for Christ or not? So that's that's a uh, uh, comparison of that parable. Um, then I look at Matthew twenty one, and Jesus uses this parable of how that people. He was really pointing it at the religious leaders of his day of how that those who were left in charge were not faithful. Those who were left with responsibility, just as that steward we just talked about, had selfish motives instead of the motives of that God wanted them to have when he left them with the responsibility. And, and in Matthew chapter 21, verse um, 33, he says, hear a parable, a landowner planted a vineyard. I'm going to paraphrase. And he, so he set a hedge, he, he fixed it. He, he goes how that he made it all just right. And he left it to these people who worked for him, but mm -hmm. greed, selfishness took over and they rejected the people that the landowner sent back and he's comparing of course the leaders of his day and their fathers who killed the prophets God tried to send warnings he tried to send emissaries to keep them doing the right thing so today when we are sent prophets from God also known as the scriptures, people who are teaching the scriptures, do we accept them or do we throw them to the wayside for our own greed? And we want to take what is not ours. Right. So, uh, what, um, you got any questions or any thoughts? No, man, I'm just saying that's right, you know. Yeah. And then in Matthew 22, there's another one about um, an invitation that God, that Jesus compared a king or a wealthy man, and he prepares this great feast for all the people around him. And, and he's not charged, you know, it's, it's a free thing. But the people around him are jealous of him and they don't want to be included in the graciousness of this king or this wealthy man. And so they disdain him and use excuses of why they can't serve, can't go to this feast. And so Jesus is using this parable to make the Jews who thought that they were the um, chosen child, shall I say, of the, 
the spoil mm -hmm. child, I call them. Uh, well, we've got it all and we don't have to. We don't have to come to the feast. We don't care about the master. He's, we already got everything. He's already told us we, we had everything. Mm -hmm. So they ignored him. And so God has given us everything. We can be the favored child. Will we squander it? Will we say, oh, I don't care about my father. He's always there. I don't have to worry about him. I don't need to work for him. But it angered the, the rich man, the king. And he said, well, if those who are invited, those who I have favored, they don't want me, I will throw them out. And I know that there are people out there in the street that they look down upon and they are disdained when they see them. And they say, oh, those terrible people. God says, or this rich man says, I'll let them come in and have this feast. And so that's what he did. And this, we can see that God sent the gospel to the Gentiles, though for the dogs of the world in the eyes of the favored children, the Jews, who didn't deserve anything, were not even supposed to be considered by God in the same realm. But God gave them the feast and he threw out those who thought that they had it made. So it's yeah. we need to remember that we are not a respected, special group. I think sometimes in the United States, many people think, oh, well, we're in the United States. We're the Christian nation. God's going to give us everything. We don't have to. Wrong. God will throw us out of this wonderful land if we do not take care of it, which we have stepped a long ways into not taking care of it. You can think about Jamaica, the many people there. How in years, many years past, were there not lots of resources there that have been squandered away and wasted and torn apart? God gave the world a beautiful place to us. What are we doing with it? But even more important, God gave us a spirit to be with him that we can go to a most wonderful place. Mm -hmm. We make that sacrifice. And a lot of these parables were, will you submit to God who can give you everything? Will you Take a little time, make a sacrifice of the things that you have that sometimes you think are the greatest things that cannot be replaced. But will you look at that pearl of great price that's out there, that treasure in that field and not see? Do we see the value of some things that are before us that we have uh, allowed other things? to blind us. And I think that that reference I made in Ecclesiastes tells the picture of some of these parables that Solomon said because of material things and because of our wants and needs of our immediate focus, sometimes we miss uh -huh the greatest picture out there in front of us yeah. of something way more important. And God wants us to see that. And I think that the 11th chapter of Hebrews, the book, that the, the yeah. chapter in Hebrews that talks about the great faith of people, mm -hmm. that great faith that we can have as they had gave those people vision. And we can see things with a great faith in God that others cannot. Or will we look with God's eyes 
<coughs> will we look at things? I want to go to um, First Corinthians for a moment uh -huh. and try to compare things uh, of this life that Jesus was using these parables. But at the beginning, when Paul began to write to the Corinthians in the first chapter, and then we see this also in the first chapter of Romans, how the most important thing today for Paul in his time was the gospel of Christ. Which mm -hmm. which chapter, sir? And the preaching, sir. Which chapter of First Corinthians? Uh, first chapter, chapter one. Okay. Chapter one, and look at verse. Um, uh, for, verse eighteen is where I, I want to look at. Verse eighteen. Mm -hmm. Where this message of Jesus Christ dying on the cross, being buried and rising again, that is the good news. That is the gospel of Christ. <laughs> but see what Paul says about it? He said, for the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. You see? To those who do not see our position compared to God, who do not see our, our position of being lost and condemned. And that's back in chapter um, one of Romans. The righteousness of God is the cross of Christ. Are we there, Carson? Carson? Hello. Hello. Carson? Yes, sir. I lost you. Okay, oh, I'm I, I see you back now. Mm -hmm. Are you hearing me? Yes, sir. I'm hearing you. Okay. Um, I was saying, you know, the gospel of Christ is considered foolishness to those who do not believe. We are considered by the, the wise people of this age, in our age, these, uh, these people who teach uh, atheism, who teach evolution, we are considered foolish people who believe in a creation by God. Uh -huh. And the same way that, Jesus, that Paul says there in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 20, where is the wise? Where is the scribe? That's the educated person. Whereas the disputer of this age has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? Because in the wisdom of God, the world through wisdom did not even know God. And so it pleased God that through the, what, the foolishness of the message preached, which is what? The gospel, which is dying, death, the death of God's son, and being raised again, they can't see it because they don't look at their position before God. And he, here he says, the Jews, God's people, they wanted a miracle. He said, show us a miracle. Prove that you're God. I don't believe you. That was their whole problem. They had no faith that Jesus was the Christ. And the Greeks looked at it like this does not make sense. So you're a bunch, you're fools to believe things like this. Have you ever heard what the elite educated people of our age think of us as Christians? We're fools in their sight, in their eyes. Can we not see the marks of evolution everywhere? How that all of these things evolved over these huge, unbelievable spans of time? And we say, well, God created it, and the evidence is there. So we're considered foolish. So those who should know and don't believe, they want some super sign. And those who think that we're on our own and we think we are our own God, they consider us fools. 
So thinking about our position with God is the key. And Jesus was trying to show the people that he spoke to how that the same thing in our common life of how the seed grow, seed are sustained with the right soil, how that honesty, the steward who was responsible, the principles of God mm -hmm. sustain mm -hmm. us, but only if we believe the truth. You see, in Hebrews chapter 11, as I mentioned a while ago, those people of great faith, it says that they, <coughs> excuse me, they could see past the troubles of this life. Jesus was trying to show those people in his day, I, you must see past these minor problems and see that great reward coming. He said in Hebrews 11, there, those people said they considered themselves just a pilgrim or, or a sojourner passing through these difficulties to a greater land pr prepared for them. Mm -hmm. But man today, in their day, saw the only the picture right in front of them of the materialistic things and the greed that they had to have those things. Whereas Peter emphasizes in chapter three of Second Peter that those things are only temporary and will all will all be destroyed. How that we need to look in faith, in a vision of faith to see the far country that is prepared for those who will persevere. Mm -hmm. And so the parables are, they are stories set down in things that we do that show us really a look at what, what, is, what is true in one situation for us to compare that how God sees us and how that we, it puts us in a, to look at a picture outside of ourselves, not in our selfish way, but outside of ourselves and compare to just where do we stand? Just what does it mean when we see these people in these different situations? And how did they get there? How did we get where we are? And what are we doing in our lives compared to other people? And I think that the parables made people think Jesus wanted him to think is, what is it, the saying today, out of the box? Look, get, get out of yourself and look backward at the true situation you are in and what, what is your effect on others, not just your inward mm -hmm. vision of yourself. And it's difficult. Well, I don't know how long... What are we doing here, Carson? You, you're good, man. You're you're on time. Um, you're doing a good you're doing a good job. But uh, Enrico, you understand so well, far? Yeah, you yeah, understand? I understand. I understand. Okay. Enri mm -hmm. Enrico, Enrico, am I am I making sense? Oh yes, yes, sir. You're making sense. You know. Okay. Well, well I'm, I'm, I'm not. Sometimes I might, I might tune I'm out again. You know, mm -hmm. the, you know the long, the attention span kind of shot. Yeah, yeah, because I was. I know. I was, I was thinking of dividing the, the the hours like between between the two hours you take like a fifteen minute break or you know. Yeah, uh, yeah, ten minute break we usually get. Okay. Like, it's okay, yeah. but you can't go because. Um, Mm -hmm. We want to we want, we want to finish at what? 11, 11 30, right? But yeah, we'll we'll finish at um 11:15. Yeah, but after after, after 11 after 11:30 we have the world class. You don't have to go on the road. Okay. Yeah, man. So we can just you know.
So Carson, what am I doing? Yes, you can continue. Well, I don't know if I had a whole lot more. <laughs> okay. Well, um, Brother John. Yeah. Uh, you, you. I'll send you. I'll send you a copy of um, the the outline this week, and um, we will follow up accordingly. Okay. But um, for next week, um, we will do a split in. Um, I will. I will go one hour, and you'll go one hour. Okay. Okay. All right. But you have. Okay. You have done. Right. You, uh, you, uh, you have so done yeah. Video. Send me that. You're gonna send me the outline that I can look at for yeah. next week. Yeah, for next week. This is us to introduce you okay. to Brother Enrico. Brother Enrico. Yes, sir. Did he pass the test, sir? Did he pass the test? Yes, sir. Oh, yeah, when you this, when, as I said. Okay. So, Brother John? I could not understand you, Enrico. Yes, yes, he, he definitely passed the test, you know? Yes, you passed the test, Brother John. <laughs> <laughs> so, Brother John. <laughs> yeah. I'm going, to, I'm going to send the links to you, and I will speak to you after I speak to brother um brother Enrico. So you could click on your 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 icon you could click leave meeting. Okay. Yeah you can click leave so, meeting and uh, have I concluded for today? Yes sir you're you're finished for today. All right I must go and serve the other master. Yes sir I know that you have to take care of that one. Sherry Yes, sir. Sister, Sister Sherry. Okay. Okay. Yes, sir. So I'll talk to you in a bit. Uh, later. later, sir. Well, right. John. Goodbye, Enrique. Yes, sir. I don't sir, know goodbye. how to get out of this. But... Yes, there's a button that says um, leave oh, meeting. Sir, leave or leave. No, leave, leave. There is a button uh, icon. Oh, oh, I see it. It's too mm -hmm. plain. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yes, sir. Leave meeting. Goodbye, Carson. Goodbye. Yes, sir. I'll talk to you in a couple of minutes. I'll speak to you in a couple of minutes. Hey, brother Enrico. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. For the next couple of minutes, um, you can open the um the PDF file um. Uh, figures of speech. Uh, brother, uh, brother John will be uh, speaking mainly on the parables. All right. Okay. Uh -huh. So open that um, PDF file. Figures of speech. The parable is written in different, many different um, figures of speech. Uh, you know what? Is, you know what are figures of speech? Figures of speech. Like, um, simile, um, irony, metaphor. Okay. You know what are those? Oh, yeah. You're teaching English now, or? Brother Enrico. Yes, sir. Are you being funny, sir? No, man. No, no, no. <laughs> no, it's just, that the, it's just that the parables are written in different parts of speech, okay? That is huh? you know? Yes, man. It's, it's... Okay. okay. Listen, listen. Hold on. Hold on, brother. What's hold on? Hold on. Let me just show you something. Oh. Yeah. Oh, I'm not seeing it on, on my screen, sir. No, I remember I sent you the file. Remember I sent you the file, sir? Wait a for Let me go on there.
I send it to your email. Yes, sir. Um, Part of speech. Figures of speech. Oh, brother, Henry, mm -hmm. you seem like a busy man, man. You get a lot of email during the week. Huh? You can't yeah. find my email? <laughs> I, get, I get a lot of emails, man. Um, it, it's just because I need subscribe to some of these things. You know, you know I, need, I, well, I need to unsubscribe to some of these things. Wow. Just type in, in the search box, man. Search box, box um, Carson Daily. Or type in my email address, Carson.daily. And it will come up. All the mails from me will come up. I guess you only have one mail from me. Oh, yeah, I'm seeing it. Just start yeah. to. Oh, parables on PDF, right? Not parables PDF. That, that is the class, that is the original document that we're going to study. There's another one that is called um, Figure of Speech. you are seeing it? There are two documents side and side. Oh, yeah, I see, I see. I see, sir. Yeah. Yeah, I see. It. Open it for me. Part of speech. Mm -hmm. You see, because you're being funny this morning. And <laughs> very, um, <laughs> I just want to... The first paragraph states in the New Testament, right? Yes, sir. All right. Um, there's a scripture verse in the second paragraph. The disciples claim bluntly that in John 16 and verse 29. Look on that scripture verse for me. John 16, verse 29. This is not an English class, all right? But Jesus was the master of English. Or is. Was and is and, right. and will be. John 16 and verse 29, sir. Can you read it for me, sir? When you find it, I just want to. Which version are you using? King James version. Yes, sir. That's the correct one. Read it for me. Verse twenty-nine. Okay. Said his disciples said to him, "See, now you are speaking plainly." And using no figure of speech. Okay. Mm -hmm. Is that English class, sir? Well, it's well, it's everything you need. <laughs> yes, it has everything. Well, it's everything good. So, in the parables, most of the parables, um, Jesus spoke in figures of speech, like simile. Um, so, let us go back to the document. Let us go back to the document. So just for smart persons like you know, that's why that scripture verse is the first one. I know that you're gonna come with it, English class. Huh? <laughs> oh my no, I was I was mixed up my guess. I was a little bit mixed up there, Yeah, man. All right, so the first paragraph in the New Testament, the life in the life of Jesus teaches teaching, Jesus depicts four gospel, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. In these gospel, Jesus records speaking in all different kinds of metaphorical and figurative um, statements in order to illustrate meaning, which are figures of speech, okay? Yes, sir. The kingdom of heaven is light. What figure of speech is that? All right, now, second paragraph. The disciples claim bluntly in John 16, 29, 
Yes, now you are speaking plainly, but not in any figure of speech. Jesus speaking figure of speech, including parables, okay? Parables of figure of speech, allegories, simile, idioms, irony, repetition, exaggeration, and even sarcasm, okay? Now, go down to um, Jesus speaking in figures of speech, parables, and, and similes. Read that for me. Oh, Jesus speaks in uh, okay. I don't know. I don't know. Um, I don't know. No, man. no, man. The above that, Jesus speaks in figures of speech, parables, and similes. Okay. So mm. some of the parables that, that Jesus teaches are similes. Where some sometimes, or where something such as God's kingdom is compared to someone else losing the word life. For example, Jesus says, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field, which someone mm -hmm. found and hide. Then in his, uh, in his joy, he goes uh, and sells all that he has and uh, buys uh, that field. What is 13 verse? Mm -hmm. You know. Said in, in this short parable of the hidden treasure, Jesus mm -hmm. explained that, that the kingdom of God is a something so valuable that, that the character in the story sells all that he, he has in order to obtain it. Okay, so in this parable, he uses the word like, right? Comparing the kingdom of God to what? In Matthew 13 and verse 44, he's comparing the kingdom of God to what? Brother Enrico, sir, he's comparing the kingdom of God to what? In Matthew 13 and verse 44. For example, Jesus says the kingdom of heaven is like a hidden treasure. Okay? So he's comparing the kingdom of heaven to a hidden what? Treasure. Hidden treasure. Yeah. So that's, that's a figure of speech that has been used there is similar. Comparing something to something else. Okay? Now, the next figure of speech is irony. Read for me. All right. Jesus speaks in speeches of a, oh, Jesus speaks in figure of speech called I, in the, idiom. Idiom, yeah. Idioms, which mm -hmm. is uh, when the meaning of a statement is different uh, than the literal meaning of mm -hmm. words used. In those, Idioms uh, change the culture to culture. Change from culture, to culture, to culture. culture. So a modern example might include let the cat out of the bag or spill the beans, which which both mean telling a, a secret or mm -hmm. or feeling under the weather meaning not very well. Okay. Okay. So, so the upcoming scripture verse is going to give you an example of what uh, uh, idiom is. Okay. Yes, sir. Luke yeah. 40, verse 26. Jesus mm -hmm. says, Whoever comes to me and does not hate and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brother and sister, yes, and even life itself cannot be my mm -hmm. disguise. <laughs> But that was strict. I mean, yes. you think that it's strict enough, but, but really, actually, mm -hmm. it's just giving like a, it's a, it's a figure of speech because it, it's not like this. Yes. It, it, mm -hmm. it, it, it doesn't want you. Why would he tell you to show it up if you want to do it? Yeah. So, mm -hmm. I think President will understand what he says, you know? Yeah, so so when, when persons at congregation read the scripture verse and said, you know what, you have to hate your mother and father, you know, you know? some person literally preaches in and, you know, I say, you have to hate them, the Bible said that, but it's just a figure of speech, all right? Mm -hmm. huh? It's just a figure of speech, but Matthew, Luke 14 and verse 26 said that, look on the version from Matthew 10 and verse 37, look what Matthew 10 and verse 37 said, find it and read it. 
You can find it in your Bible. Oh, it's not in this? No, I didn't paste it and I didn't, I didn't put it in. Matthew 10 and verse 37. Okay. Oh, Matthew 10 and verse 37? Yes. He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Mm -hmm. So it is a two script, two same scripture verse, two same meaning, right? Mm -hmm. Just the, the Luke 14 and verse 26 was just written in a part of speech, right? You who hates father and mother more than me. You all right, sir? You feeling pain? Mm -hmm. huh? Are you feeling okay. pain? So to explain this scripture verse, the second scripture verse, Matthew 10 and verse 37, explain Luke 14 and verse 26. It, does, it is just telling us if you love your father and mother more than God, you know? Yes, sir. You know, no. The other part of it, the other figure of speech is repetition. Go down. Jesus speaking figure of speech of re repetition. Read that for me. What are repetitions, sir? Oh, Jesus speak in the figure of speech of repetition, such as mm -hmm. when Jesus repeatedly saying, but unless you repent, you will all be perish as they mm -hmm. did. Luke chapter 13, verse mm -hmm. 1 to 5. Okay. Repetition is, all, is often used in a years to <laughs> emphasize a point. Okay. So repetition is a part of speech, okay? Also, it is used to what? Emphasize. Mm -hmm. You know, so during preaching, they'll tell you to um, repeat your topics um, during certain interval. Every 10 minutes, you repeat your topic just to, to emphasize it. Now, Jesus speaking figure of speech, um, exaggeration and hyperbole. Read for me. I soon let you go, man. I look like you're going through pain. <laughs> I look like you're hungry or something. Eh? No, 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 no. no. Good. Said, so, all right, Jesus speak, speaks in the figure of speech called hyperbole, hyperbole. Mm -hmm. which is an ironic statement that, that uses exaggeration in mm -hmm. order to emphasize a point. Some examples of Jesus using exaggeration mm -hmm. uh, include you blind um, guide, guides, mm. you straight out. You strain mm -hmm. out uh, a, a gent, but swallow a mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. when you read that scripture verse, you know, it is just Jesus is only speaking in a figure of speech that is called hyperbole, all right? Mm -hmm. You know? Matthew 23. Yeah. Matthew 23, verse 24. Read on. That Jesus is explaining that the Pharisees focus on the outward appearance. Of righteousness, mm -hmm. but inside they are evil. They are mm -hmm. uh, concerned with worldly things, but uh, they have neglected mm -hmm. the, 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 oh, the wider matter of the, of the law, justice and mercy and faith. Mm -hmm. Matthew 23, verse 23. Um, yeah. Now, um, the other figure of speech is sarcasm. Well, well, just like the first time thing. you have to go to all of them. Sir. Huh? Just, 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 just like yes, the first you, you think you think some Christians um behave like a Pharisee more than? Yes, more Christian believe. More they, they, more they look at the outward appearance, right? Yes. What what yes. a man um. <laughs> for, for example, brother. Many of us as preachers, we behave like Pharisees. Preachers, because guess what? As preachers, we go around and we say, okay, I am better than you, right? I yeah, can yeah, preach yeah. better than you, and we put ourselves on a pedestal, right? Yes, yeah, really, really. And when, when another brother comes around, who we look down on and they preach, we criticize them, you know? You know, we're the we're same as the Pharisees. We criticize each other in the church. We look down on each other. You know, in the congregation, you have persons with PhD, they're treated different, right? Oh, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Yes, yeah, they're treated different from a regular man like me and you with CXC, right? Mm -hmm. You understand? So, yeah. if it was, you know, it is, but these parables teach, teach us not to be like that, you know? No, the next, um, next figure of speech is sarcasm, which everybody loves, sarcasm. Okay, so yeah, you are, you are like, mm -hmm. Jesus Read on. in figure of speech called sarcasm, such as the way he mocks the Pharisees, saying, For you are like whitewashed tools. Okay, so we use that too, you know, as, as human beings, we say, You're whitewashed, so folk, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, sarcasm. What are you saying? Read on. Which of the um, outside, which on the outside look beautiful, but inside uh, they are full of the bones of the dead and of all kinds of filthy. Yes, the thing about this, now, when, when Jesus was speaking in this par part of speech, I figured of speech, the Pharisees, they had problem in understanding, you know? Understanding what Jesus was saying, you know? Calling the man white was so called because and calling the Pharisees white was so called because they have problem with understanding. Now, um, so you know, as we close off here, these are some figures of speech that we're going to identify as we look through our parables, okay? Yes, sir. All right, so you need to go and get some rest or something wrong with you or something. You're tired. <laughs> my head, my head. Yeah, you need to get a seat that is very soft or something, you know. Okay, yeah. okay, okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, man, you know, don't be a white wash of all kind of. Don't tell me you're okay and inside you're not okay. Man. Tell. Hello? Yes, sir. Don't be a white wash of all kind. Don't be okay on the outside and on the inside. You know. Listen to me, man. You don't look okay, okay? You look tired. Oh, we look tired. <laughs> yes, you look tired. Uh, I, was, I can't believe the movie, movie, I'm um, speaking so much, like, you know? But <laughs> that's how it goes on that. Yeah, but we, I promise that this class won't be so long so it, because the two hour, I think it's a bit long, the two hour. Yeah. But um, we, will, we will do our best to split it, you know? It, so, it, it, it's okay, man. This is, this is school, you know? You have to do a yeah. to do tell, me, tell me something. The next, student, the next student, what happened? What happened to Med, Medios? I don't know. He's not participating. I don't, I don't hear anything from him. Mm -hmm. What happened to the young lady? Oh, Sister Solomon. Mm -hmm. Did you send a document to her? If I send a document to her? Mm -hmm. Oh, no, man. Remember, I asked you to send it to her. And then that's your thing. Mm -hmm. Yesterday, no, sir, I, I went straight to put someone and sent it to yesterday. No, man. That's but why you're tired, man. Because was rough, man. I was, I, was, I was washing, cleaning, and cooking, and everything. So. Okay. All right, that's why you're tired, sir. Have a good day. Go get some rest, all right? <laughs> <laughs> Look like people are sleeping pretty much. <laughs> yeah, man, go get some rest, okay? All right. Yeah, man. Mm -hmm.